Right. Welcome colleagues, both live in person to International House and also for those who are joining us on the Zoom space. This is the first event this week um, of the IAS annual theme, Breathe, um, a series of events that are happening as we, um, as we uh, reach the finale of that theme over the course of this week. And we are joined by some fantastic uh, um, visiting scholars, as well as a range of colleagues across the campus for a whole host of interesting events. If you are joining online, let me give you a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, so you are probably familiar already, but if you aren't, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A and also a chat button. Um, you are welcome to use either of those to feed in comments or questions during the course of the um, sessions this morning, and those will be brought into the conversation because we are monitoring those. So please do feel free to use that um, and know that your questions will be seen uh, registered and also hopefully hopefully answered and discussed. So please do feel free to, to use that format. Um, for those who are in the room, we are being picked up principally by the owls. So if you are directing your questions toward the front or the speaker, you'll be directing toward an owl. If you're sitting in this part of the room, it's best to sort of speak a little bit toward this direction when the questions happen. And they will and the both the video and the audio will pick you up in that way. Um, my colleague here and I will be monitoring the sound as well a bit over the course. So we will know what's happening in terms of that. So that's that's the housekeeping. Um, and if I can now um, say, um, my name is Marsha Meskimen. I'm the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies. And it is my great pleasure to be welcoming um, my colleagues today um, to this fantastic event on air quality measurement. One of the things about Breathe has been that it has brought together an incredible interdisciplinary group of scholars throughout the year. And one of the fantastic areas of this has been to really think about air quality and about how critical those issues are, not only from a scientific um, perspective, but how politicized those issues are, how um, critical they are in terms of social health, well-being, um, and, and livelihoods. And so we're really looking forward to this session today, which will incorporate three fantastic speakers, but is convened by my colleague, Deganta Das. And I'm going to be turning now to get Deganta, who will do the introductions and discuss this um, session with everyone, as well as chair the conversation at the end. So with no further ado, Deganta, it's over to you. Thank you, Marsha. Uh... Welcome everyone and uh, good morning, uh, whether you are in the room uh, or online. Uh, so as Marsha said, um, this session uh, is uh, going to uh, discuss air yeah, quality measurements uh, and in particular uh, health effects uh, of how air quality uh, might have. So I'm, I'm one of the co-leads for this team, uh, one of the four co-leads uh, and in case you do not know me, I'm based in chemical engineering department. Uh, I'm a reader in porous materials, uh, where I look at effects of various particles and porous materials. Now, one of the main thing about this team that we are leading at the moment is also how future collaborations might come in. So as well as uh, discussing uh, air quality and its measure measurements and health effects is a future trend uh, that's also very interesting for us because it's the future trend you know what kind of projects we want to look at what kind of issues that we need to look at for the future and so those kind of questions really uh, bring in you know future collaborations and how we can uh, maintain relationships with the invited fellows uh, and and other uh, colleagues here as well so, uh, so we have uh, three uh, speakers and we have panel discussions as well later on. So we hope to pick up uh, some of those things uh, as we progress. So the first speaker uh, this morning is uh, Professor uh, Evi Gupta. I had the pleasure of working with him for a long time. Uh, I published my second paper uh, in my career uh, with Professor Gupta and he had a long distinguished uh, career. Uh, as, a, of course, being an academic, uh, also other uh, leadership roles uh, in MNIT, uh, in Jaipur, such as head of the department, a dean of R&D, and he was also the director of the institute uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, of, of MNIT. So it's my uh, great pleasure, uh, Professor Gupta, I call him sir, uh, to, to come and uh, talk about uh, your research and how well, uh, you know, field studies and so on and so forth, how they, they bring those things, health effects and the air quality. So over to you. 
Thank you, Marsha and Jaganda, for a heavy introduction to a light person like me. When I became a professor, I was 41 kg. So my principal used to say that he's the youngest professor. I said, no, I might be the lightest across the globe with 41 kg of weight. So but good to interact with uh, Diganta again after so many years. Uh, I always boast of my students who are professors at all famous universities across the world, including RPI in New York, Illinois State University, University of Curtin, Australia, Loughborough. So it's always a pleasure. And uh, don't uh, get scared if you look at the number of slides, 56. I will skip all the mathematical portion straight away and confining myself to the philosophy of uh, air quality measurements, health measurements, and the linkages between air quality and health. And how does mathematics help in bringing out the medical aspects more sharply in order to have significant correlations between causal factors like pollution vis-a-vis -vis health. So we'll see how to assess the exposure and link it with the human respiratory system, even beyond, I'll just talk for a minute to the cardiovascular problems. How it all started was I was working on water and health primarily, and that's my major area, in fact, still. We are first ones internationally to have treated fluorosis patients with oral medicines, which is written as irreversible in the medical books. Then our nitrate pathophysiology works brought down the infant mortality significantly in that region. So one of the very famous doctors of respiratory medicine, Dr. Virendra Singh, he came to my house and he was describing about the conditions of one of his patients. He was trying to clean the throat of a patient and take a throat swab for further analysis. That was 1990 or 91 probably. So he says that while I was cleaning it with the wet cotton swab, which is a very soft material, suddenly the asthma attack precipitated in that patient. So I asked him, so what could be the reason for this trauma which initiated the attack? He said, itching of the mucous membrane lining may result into irritation of the line, inflammation, and that is what asthma is all about. Inflammation reduces the airway passage. So I said, this much of itching can be produced due to the sheer stresses produced during intense coughing. He says, what are you saying? Many of my patients say that if they have a deep coughing bout, they have an attack precipitated. So we made a model, trachea and the first bronchioles. His brother was doing his BTEC in civil engineering from IIT Bombay. So I designed it in the biomedical department. We measured the wall shear stresses in the model under various simulated conditions. And we proved that that much of itching is very much possible in uh, intense coughing. So it led to the shear stress theory, which was published in the Journal of Asthma, which is a very high ranked journal. And also it brought out how can mathematics really be applied to human systems. And I'll proceed further with many more examples. Now, this is one of the first studies in India of its kind where due to the environmental impact assessment laws which were enacted, there was a clause in which public was allowed to raise complaints against any industries. So we got this project through Rajasthan Pollution Control Board as certain villages near ACC cement plant of Lakheri, which is about 250 kilometers from my place, complained of respiratory problems. So we had to establish, we were given this study to establish some causal factors. And luckily Diganta was one of them who was a part of the team nine engineers led by Diganta and five medical students. We did a questionnaire survey of about 2,100 people, which is a modified ATS-DLD questionnaire, American Thoracic Society and Department of Lung Diseases. We converted that 
questionnaire to suit our requirements. And this questionnaire, interestingly, is to be filled by non-medical only. So that you take on an average nine to 10 minutes for filling up. It con uh, confines itself to recording of certain symptoms or morbidities to cough, phlegm, wheezing, and dyspnea. It also has a lot of provisions to ask about the history of the patient, person, sorry. Because if doctor analyzes, he will make, make him a patient, him or her a patient. That's why doctors are not supposed to carry out this questionnaire survey. Now different morbidities are recorded and their uh, past history of respiratory illness is also recorded. So that we don't compare those people with the normal people. So ultimately we filter out the data and compare among those populations which are running, which are living in a nearby relatively safe zone vis-a-vis -vis that of the affected people, postulated affected by this industry. So we took two villages in the major windward, direct, windward direction and a control village and carried out 20, uh, 325 chest x-rays, 325 spirometries, so the lung function tests. And now when we started doing our mathematics, we were perplexed that the control population and the so-called postulated affected population would not show any statistical significance. Whereas it was very evident when we did the door-to-door -door survey. So again, mathematics came to our oh, There are equations available, regressions for expected value of peak expiratory flow rate, which is one of the major lung functions which gets affected and gives acute impact on the respiratory system. Now, if a person records less than 80% of this expected value, then he is termed as affected due to this typical obstructive disease. It was not coming out to be significant, but the morbidities were very high. The difference was not significant. So for the first time, we introduced a structured value of PEFR. If the observed value is less than 80, less but equal to 60 or more, we called it as mild symptom, 60 to 40 as moderate, and less than 40 as severe symptoms. The moment we did this, all our regression equations were perfect. There was a huge difference between the two populations in terms of severity. So we went again to the control village and found to find out the reasons. And we found that this was used for mining. There was a hillock which was separating industry with this village, but that hillock was used for years for mining purposes. Only when we chose this village, there was no mining going on. So we thought that it was a safe control. So it's very important to bring right kind of controls, right kind of hypothesis to bring out meaningful values from the results. So we chose the controls, highly affected village, lesser affected, compared the three villages for symptoms of cough, phlegm, dyspnea, and then applied the chi-square test for significance testing. And, and as I said, initial values, no significant difference, final values, very significant differences in severe, severe and moderate problems, though not much in the mild problems because of the reasons I have already indicated. So I'm skipping the mathematics. So major outcomes, for the first time in India, this kind of protocols were developed for health linkages due to industrial pollution. And we made our questionnaire in our own way, taking a lot from ATS DLD and then what to monitor, how to monitor, where to monitor, these were all established. In fact, as I'll come later, our country is indicating, I don't know why proudly, that 33 of the most polluted cities of the world are in India. So what is the policy behind it? I would also like to show. So we have a tendency in fact to exaggerate about the symptoms and, and something which I mean, if it's not established with scientific way, at least I don't believe in it. 
So we made our own protocols for lung function tests, then how to analyze the data to establish causal linkages, how to draw appropriate controls, and this final classification of PFR is still used even after 30 years for classifying the severity. So some of the papers published are indicated. Then uh, very near to this Lakheri, there is a Kota thermal power plant, which already had five units, producing about 220 megawatt. A sixth unit was to come up. So the case was referred to me. I carried out a lot of mathematical uh, dispersion analysis and told that if at all the sixth unit has to come up, you have to improve the air pollution control efficiency of all the devices put together because we identified many hotspots in Kota City that were affected by thermal power plant pollution. And the linkages were very, very strong. I said, you already should have improved by now, but if the sixth unit has to be allowed, you have to act rather than just keep on promising. So this also came up. And then I introduced a course on environment health linkages, which I've been teaching for last 25 years, 24 years, where we do a lot of mathematics for water quality and health, air quality and health, noise and health. And this has initiated a lot of medical studies across our country because I bring out some hypothesis, try to have some proof of concept, which is then validated by a team of doctors. So I'm connected to practically best of the doctors of Jaipur, which is a city where a lot of improvement has taken place over the last three decades in the medical profession. And a lot of publications are coming up. Otherwise, in our medical field in India, there was not any tradition of doing much research. So research was a game of somebody else, it seems. Then we shifted our attention to outdoor ambient air quality and health. And I had a couple of research projects where we did extensive receptor-based model. So rather than putting the monitoring stations, air uh, meteorological stations at a height, we had a tripod-based monitoring station. And then we had continuous air quality monitors so that they match the frequency. And then we had a series of continuous data for years together. And that was as long back as in 1997. In India now, it's a tradition to have continuous air quality monitoring stations in every city for last 10 years. But this was almost 27 years back. So this, how to bring out the hotspots, how to take the corrective measures, declaring certain streets with one-way traffic, where is the great separation needed only from the point of your receptor-based monitoring? How can it be troublesome? And then we developed new models in Western literature. A lot of infinite line source models are available for dispersion. We make finite line source models because the signal-to-signal -signal distances in India are very short. So how edges tend to affect the dispersion. So a lot of those things were carried out. We all know that major things coming from the traffic are uh, particulate matter, and the particle deeper it goes, and then causes certain specific kinds of problems. But finer the particle, more specific surface they have, so they tend to absorb many of the toxicants which are emitted simultaneously. And those toxic gases also go deep. And I've been working on PM and NOx synergistics for a long time in both outdoor air as well as indoor air. And hence, the role of fine particles has been further exacerbated, uh, exacerbated due to the attached gaseous qualities. So these are some of the data I've interacted with Dr. Pope, who has published more than a thousand papers perhaps the largest number across the globe. And he was presenting a paper. He is a person from economics and statistics. So he was presenting his keynote, a 20 minute keynote packed with knowledge. So he identified that there are some of the graphs which I could not model properly. 
came back. He was sitting just next to me. I said, Professor Bo, the reason why you did not clearly establish the correlations or regressions was that they all involved SpO2. Now people, have, everyone knows about SpO2. Those days, not many people would know about uh, oxygen pressures. So what happens is our body has enough alveoli to transfer the oxygen than what is required. So we have almost four times more alveoli in the lungs to transfer oxygen. So you don't feel any problems of shortness of breath till a critical mass is choked. And that is why I told him that you shift your x-axis up, we'll start getting better relations. He tried then and there. So uh, fine particles have been the major causes for COPD and short-term acute effects as well as long-term effects like <laughs> heart diseases, lung cancers. So we will not go into any of these, but then significance of NOx, whether in US or UK or India, vehicles ooze out a lot of nitrogen oxides. Nobody can stop it. In fact, uh, Volkswagen at one point in time boasted of a three-way catalytic converter which can take care of NOx. Mm -hmm. When my students bought that news item, I said, this is the after a year, they had a public apology tendered that no, it's not functional against NOx. Another of my interactions with Dr. Kleinman, who's a medical doctor from US and highly published and highly respected person. He was uh, delivering his keynote. I was chairing the session. So he said that the organic carbon content of the fine particles coming from the traffic can explain almost 85% of the variations in coronary heart diseases. What they did was they had control experiments in one chamber, field walls, who were made to inhale traffic particles. In the other chamber, they were made to inhale traffic particles after denuding for organic carbon. And they saw various parameters to identify the CHD uh, problems and they said 85% of the variation is attributed to organic carbon. I said, but doctor, you are missing two major parameters. One is noise, which is there, and then traffic, which you are not simulating here. That will affect your heartbeat. That will affect your blood pressure or to a good extent. And secondly, nitrogen oxides, which are vasodilators. He agreed. He says, I'll have to redo many of the studies carried out earlier. And then we carried out uh, work on noise and cardiovascular problems, along with that of fine particles. Again, Deganta was a part of the team initially, and we did a cross-sectional study of 2,500 persons. And for the first time, we had a significant association between the two. Why noise was never earlier associated with this problem was that you people are highly sensitive for any noise that I appreciate. Right? So even when the ambient noise standard 65 is exceeded to 71, you carry out studies, may not get significant differences. But we have places in India, where 80, 85 decibels are not uncommon. So I took it to the doctor. He says, oh, 10% difference or 30% difference. How will it make any difference? I said, no, this is a logarithmic scale. It means four times more noise than they're allowed versus 32 times more noise than they're allowed. And then we carried out the study and got our correlations. Same way, we started working on PM and NOx, the synergistic associations between two, and carried out extensive lung functions for the risk of asthma as well. And we started working on indoor air quality. Now, we had two groups, one working women who used to spend very little time in the kitchen. They had a domestic help. These are the housewives who would enjoy doing their cooking for say typically one and a half hours in the morning, one and a half hours in the evening. And these are LPG lit kitchens, apparently very clean. When we started recording the values, it was amazing. 
fine particles were four to five times higher than that of the most polluted marketplace in Jaipur, in an average Jaipur kitchen. And NOx, nitrogen oxide levels were five to 10 times higher than that of the market. So we started establishing PM and NOx synergistics, their effects on lungs, their effects on heart. The, then a lot of works were carried out in Jaipur. CSC carried out works in nine different cities of India, everywhere. The situation was the same. Our methodology includes a lot of optical particle counter mo monitoring of continuous fine particles, continuous NOx analyzers, CO analyzers, personal samplers for exposure assessments, spirometry for lung functions, and pulse oximeter for S uh, SpO2, and the questionnaire survey as I indicated. So we are allowed to do non-invasive tests without ethical clearances. So we confined ourselves to the measurement of certain parameters only. And when we started monitoring the values of lung functions, we were again amazed. We had given housewives the equipment to measure peak expiratory flow rate. So we asked them to measure the function in the morning, just before preparation of the lunch, uh, lunch immediately after preparing the meals, then just before dinner and after the dinner preparation. A very interesting thing came out of the mathematics that only 15% of the subjects recorded about 20% drop in PEFR pre and post preparation of meals. So we looked at their questionnaire responses. In every one of them, there was no exception both sides. Whosoever had complained of wheezing had a reduction in PEFR. So they were susceptible to asthma. Earlier, the doctors used to use absolute value of PEFR for judging somebody's susceptibility to asthma. Now what we do is we expose the person for a short uh, exposure to pollutants and measure the lung functions pre and post. So if there is a drop, the sure shot candidate for treatment for asthma. So in the field, how spirometries are carried out, health surveys, then uh, some of the papers published by us. Noise I already indicated to you because I have just three more minutes, two more minutes left. Then we extended to indoor air quality. And what we found was the chimney that you put, electric chimney, is not sufficient. It removes all the bigger particles that you can see. So you feel safe, but finer particles are still going into the random motion and they are the ones that absorb NOx, take them deep into your lungs. And we started suggesting people that you should always have an exhaust fan for the desired air exchanges. Exhaust fan should be put on the moment you are putting the burner on because nitrogen oxides are coming from air. Air has nitrogen, air has oxygen, and NOx formation is a function of temperature. So better the combustion, higher is the NOx formation. And you don't see it, you don't smell it, so you don't think about it. But uh, then we made in the rural areas certain, uh, we have just uh, made it a laboratory model with a small flame, it can rotate, this exhaust fan can rotate. So I'm extending the heat pipe. It will be for the villages. It takes out the heat of the chula or the stove. And then within two minutes, the recorded air pollutants concentrations are less than one tenth. Another interesting thing came up when we were working with rural women, they, cook in a squatting condition in some corner of the house, rather single room dwellings. We recorded the temperatures to which they were exposed. And during a meal, they were exposed to 37 degrees Celsius to 57 degrees Celsius. There's a rule in India, if it's 50, you have to stop all the offices. And this, these poor ladies are subject to much higher temperature. And then we started assessing the lung functions again and brought temperature as a modifier of lung functions 
to the medical world. So this kind of cooking practices you can see. So we worked in non-cooks and cooks and compared for rural urban kitchens and then the uh, kitchens of the commercial types, postal mass, many other places and brought out certain things. A very quick, this thing, in the kitchens we are monitoring CO and NOx both. So thought of applying my chemical engineering with a second year UG student. With CO and NOx inhaled at a particular rate, there'll be a formation of carboxyl hemoglobin and methemoglobin. And the two will result into reduction in SpO2. So we could measure SpO2 in non-invasively. We could measure carboxyhemoglobin non-invasively. So we did our modeling, did our assessments, and validated the model, which was published in the National Journal. And uh, this is the experimental validation. Later on, you can see the details whenever, if you feel interested. And then occupational exposures to marble is, uh, marble sculptures. This is the last thing which we are doing currently, pollen exposure and health. We find antihistaminics to be consumed five times more in March and September seasons due to the problems of polyptelia, amaranthus, and that is causing a lot of distress. And another thing is silicosis. I come from a state where 3.3 million people have been uh, registered as silicosis patients. This is a reversible disease, ultimately leading to ILD. You can't cure it. The only way is to prevent. So we are now developing our coefficients. We're developing preventive measures for them. Rather than a simple mask, we are uh, developing respirators so that they do not remove the mask. So I'll, I'll just leave. Another thing that we are trying out is when you take an X-ray, we try to we are trying to develop a hardware to be attached to the X-ray machine which can pick up the signatures of silicosis. So we can, because it's a notifiable disease, means if you are diagnosed with it, government has to pay for the whole health survey, health uh, uh, interventions. 10 years back, only a few tens of people were recorded. Now, 3.3 million people due to the efforts, combined efforts of doctors and engineers. So festivals, we have our own values. So forget about smoking, even the breathing is a health hazard if you are living in a city like this. And you may have to go like this ultimately if you don't take action now. So act now so that we can breathe. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That is fascinating. Uh, and some of the things actually relates to uh, other things you do at laughter as well as interest, for example, cooking, uh, stoves, uh, and, and electric cooking as well and so forth. So it's actually good to see that you have covered so many different things. Um, there might be some questions and points for discussion, but we'll pick them up uh, later on uh, in the panel discussion, but for the time finding uh, and reading. Thank you so much. Thanks. So, uh, after Professor Gupta, can I invite uh, Lali Dasinder Yassan, our next speaker, uh, a session, uh, and just to introduce briefly Dr. Dasinder Yassan, she is uh, the chairperson uh, in her department, Department of Biology at Texas Southern University, Houston, uh, and then she's going to talk about a lunar dust. And the association of lunar dust with uh, yes, yes, uh, exposure to dust, uh, uh, lunar dust lead to severe effects. So, uh, over to the leader. Thank you all for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, and I'm going to be talking about dust and pollution in, in a very out of this world way. I'm going to be talking about moon dust. Um, and um, one of the recent progresses in uh, the US, as well as uh, I think the European Space Agency as well, is that they are rekindling the interest and in actually uh, after, if you remember the Apollo missions, um, all the way from uh, in the 60s to about 1972, they, I think they 
went up to the pole of 17, um, they are they sort of it was tiny depending on political change and she was very right about the political issues um so policies change and then you have a program go up go down and things like that so now artemis is back uh, from greek mythology to a real life program where it's you know they are going to the moon one unmanned mission has already been done artemis one and artemis two artemis three and artemis three actually promises to take the first person of color and a woman uh, to be uh, actually explore the moon's surface. So it's all terribly exciting, but however, um, and I'm gonna talk about this later on in the uh, provocation as well, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip, right? If you've not heard of this, uh, this was told by Zeus to Hercules before he disembarked on his 10 labors. So again, there's a lot going on that you have to circumvent at first to be able to achieve your goals. And even then you might not be able to. So uh, we got interested in, um, and Artemis, you know, is a Greek god. So uh, you guys know this better than I do. Uh, so Luna Gus, uh, at the time I got interested in it, uh, it was about when they were setting standards uh, of exposure, okay? So I got involved in working on projects with Luna Dust, looking at, the toxicity at the cellular level, because it wasn't possible. Um, they were doing some intratracheal uh, distillation in, uh, uh, in rats, and they were doing some human, well, they weren't doing any human studies, but they were looking at uh, skin grafts exposing the dust, because they had brought back lots of dust. Um, but then again, the dust had changed properties because yeah. when they were bringing it back, the physical traits of the dust actually broke the vacuum seals. Um, and so they were exposed to the moisture and oxygen on the way back. So they lost some of the properties. So if you think of the moon as a 4 billion year old desert, right? And billions of meteorites coming in and bombarding it on a daily basis, the soil gets hammered. And the soil then becomes, you, you fractionate the soil and the soil, there's part of it that becomes the dust. And lunar dust is considered um, all the way, anything less than 100 microns. And I have individual papers uh, relating to particle sizes uh, because you have to mill the particles before you use them on cells. And I particularly, I'm a cell biologist, so obviously cells are of my interest, but then cells afford a bit of a different model. Uh, you could take out the neuroendocrine stress because in your body, uh, any disease, anything at all, you're looking at uh, the effect of everything right, the neuroendocrine stress. But in a cell, you can isolate certain things. You can isolate your variables and then look at it. So why are we going to the moon? Well, you know, you can, the obvious discovery, economic benefits, um, obviously inspiration, we do things like Kennedy said, because not because they're easy, but because they are hard, right? And let me tell you, everything that NASA does, a lot of it has indirect benefits for life on earth. It's a lot, a lot of things from Velcro, right, to even materials that are used to make baseballs, uh, cricket balls, tennis balls. And I learned that at Wimbledon uh, when I went to the exhibition at the museum this time because we weren't allowed to go into the courts or anything. Um, there's a lot of indirect benefits. Um, uh, there's a lot of therapies that have come out of uh, space-related work. So all of this is going to give us a good hope for the entire approach of public health and everything else. Uh, it just has to be sort of synergized. Um, so they want to build a global alliance. Of course, they can't go at it alone, okay? And this is all just a little bit of overview. So they're trying to build a base camp. Um, and also there's a lunar gateway that's going to be uh, launched. And all of this, initially, they'll have a lot of robots as well as astronauts trained on the site to explore and conduct more science than ever. And some of the vehicles are the Orion, um, and then um, space launch rocket systems. Uh, SpaceX is doing some of this work, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origins. There's a number of companies, Axiom Space. There's a bunch of companies that are going to be involved in this. Let me go through this quickly. This is what they envision the gateway to look like. And that's the base camp of Artemis where they'll have to live in. So there's going to be a lot of extravehicular activity. Remember this, now they're trying to go to Mars and they've been trying a long time. Right, we were supposed to be in Mars by 2025. Uh, the station was supposed to be uh, uh, dissolved in 2020. That didn't happen because everything takes time. There's a lot of issues that are very different 
from here, from life on Earth, right? So that goes on as well. So, and then this is, you know, uh, this is a picture and all of this has been envisioned based on all the Apollo missions uh, as to what it would look like. Uh, this is in the South Pole and everything happens differently with the side of the moon that faces the sun, for example, has different forces acting on it, whereas the particles on the other side of the moon at that time could be very different as well. So let's cut to the chase a little bit and come to the work that we did. Um, what is lunar dust? Well, it's a uh, uh, mostly silicon uh, dioxide, more than 50% of it. Uh, there's other, saw, uh, the, uh, there's other uh, elements in it, uh, rich in iron particles, rich in um, uh, calcium, magnesium, um, and also uh, it's positively charged, uh, very adhesive, very sticky, very pervasive, very abrasive. And they say that in 1G, the dust would probably, and these are based on model work, uh, that they would, uh, it would probably be taken care of partially by the main airways. And you saw a picture of the respiratory system that which Dr. Gupta showed and uh, not really go to the peripheral area, but in partial gravity, and this is where gravity, and I, I'll talk a little bit uh, about gravity later on in the afternoon. Remember that all life on earth is known 1G, 9.8 per meters per second squared. And what happens to a cell, your whole body, when you take gravity away, your body initially adapts, but there's too many, I mean, there's too many differences, no convection, no Coriolis forces, there's a, no erosion, Okay, partial gravity. So when they do the extravehicular activities on the moon, they come back and then it's zero gravity. So everything goes in once they take the suit out. It's not possible with a brush to dust it away. We'll have to find, uh, you know, Goliath brush or something. It, it, they haven't been able to do it. And I just, you know, recently uh, another colleague showed me, uh, you know, where they've made these. Uh, uh, barbies and they put space suits on these barbies and 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 doused them with uh, uh, the volcanic dust from Mount Helena and then tried to uh, sort of just pulverize them with liquid nitrogen. Right, it works, but can you take liquid nitrogen to space? No, you can't. So there's a lot, lot still to be worked on. Okay, and and human health, you know, it's 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 a what what is it? It's it, you know, it's a quagmire, right? It's you go in there and you can swim for the rest of your life and everybody, every generation. There's new problems coming, new viruses, new bacteria, um, new sorts of issues. And inflammation is a very different kettle of fish when you go to space. So everything is exacerbated. So everything is very similar, I would say, to uh, accelerated aging. So we're gonna talk a little bit about partial gravity, about zero gravity and the changes there as well. So again, a lot of these anecdotal evidences came from the uh, reports of the astronauts and the Apollo missions and uh, studied. Uh, and this time they've also seen that even in 1G, this can cause a lot of rashes on skin grafts. They already know that. And uh, so uh, a lot of irritation, inflammation, again, uh, leading to ocular, respiratory, and skin diseases. And partial gravity, it could possibly be a peripheral lung issue and the main airways might not be able to take care of these things. So again, it could uh, contaminate any internal epithelium. Uh, it could cause burn injuries inside too, um, where you, you could have, especially the alveoli, which are the, even though we might have four times more, uh, depends on you know, prolonged bioavailability of this dust. And then you could have uh, issues where, and if you see the alveoli, uh, and it's impossible to mimic this uh, in the cellular model, because if you see the endothelial cell, and the alveolar epithelial cell juxtaposed like that. I would love to be able to model this in vitro, but it's almost impossible because you, you have to do primary um, uh, cell experiments. It's almost impossible to do it. There's such a little cusp where the gas exchange goes through. It is really impossible to model that. Model that in the sense, I don't mean computer modeling. I mean, actual creation of a particular model. So again, let's look at what's going to happen. So we hypothesized that the contamination of the epithelia and wounds could affect the wound healing process and also the DNA repair process. So we worked with two types of cells. We worked with lung epithelial cells and skin fibroblasts. The skins, the fibroblasts is like, you know, you get an Amazon package, you find those peanuts. So fibroblasts are cells that are fillers, packing cells, and they are almost ubiquitous. They are present, you know, entirely in your body. 
um, in many, many places. So we used a simulant of lunar dust and uh, NASA makes it available to us. I was funded by the Human Research Program at the time. And uh, we tested the effect on the lung epithelium and the fibroblasts. Um, again, there's a lot of fibroblasts play also a repair. Uh, you know, when lung scarring occurs, you know, you have fibrosis, right? And uh, we wanted to see if the fibroblasts were enabled in any way too. So we were looking at two sides of the coin. So the cells getting their function was, det uh, you know, that was there a detriment as well as was there an enhancement because you don't want to uh, promote fibroblasts to an extent where they could then cause fibrosis in parts where they were not, not even scarred, but they could do that. Cells go all right. I mean, it's like, like a person, right? They could go crazy. So. Um, so again, based on the reports from Apollo missions, right? So we were really interested in these human airway epithelial cells. And this is a very special cell. It was the Cali-3. Now, how do we develop these allergies? We've talked a lot about allergies. So what is the mechanism? Why are we hypersensitized? Well, there are these in the cells, they like to talk to each other just like we do. And they sort of juxtapose like this, okay, with each other. Okay, this is the membrane of one cell. So this is the apical surface. This is the basal lateral surface. And this is the side wall of the cell. So cells are bandied together and you know, you go like a deck of cards, but not everything can go from this cell to this cell. There are these particular proteins that make these little zips and junctions, they call tight junctions and gap junctions. But these tight junctions are nothing can go. Gap junctions will let certain things go in. So if you work on a cell with no gap junctions, you're basically trying to kill an unarmed man. Kill Pran, right? No point. So um, you have to use the right model and that's very important. And so these Cali-3 cells, even though they were transformed cells, they have the gap junctions. So you, you would see a real effect if there was one. So we treated, uh, uh, you know, we dissolved uh, or suspended the lunar simulant, um, JSCA1, one, uh, one that, that's the one that we used at uh, 50 micrograms per ml. So we did weight by volume uh, of hand mill lunar simulant. And then we used silica as a positive control because there was so much silica in the lunar simulant and titanium dioxide as a negative control. I'm gonna go a little tad faster here. And again, this was evaluated uh, by the uh, lactase, uh, lactate dehydrogenase assay. These are actual representatives of cells that are in the epithelium of your main air airways. So let's see, all particle species we saw were internalized as the cells were growing. We could visualize this under the microscope. I'll show you images shortly. Morphological changes and physical membrane changes. And you know, you put your grandmother's very valued silk scarf in a chest, in a treasure chest opened after 10 years. You take the scarf out, what happens? I'm gonna show you pictures in just a second. And the rank order of toxicity was basically that silica was the most toxic, obviously, um, while titanium dioxide was the least, but then just hold your thought right there about the titanium dioxide. We're gonna revisit that in just a second. And LDS, the similar toxicity was in between the uh, silica and the titanium dioxide. And the internalization was the greatest with uh, titanium dioxide. And this was a surprise because you know what titanium dioxide is, right? Everybody here, uh, if you've taken um, your uh, sunscreen, yes, lots of it, they, it's now used in your cereal to improve the shelf life. Um, the Department of Defense and everywhere they use it to coat the roads so that it traps smog. It's also a sterilizer. Um, so, and also it can, it's also used in paint and newsprint as well. So it's kind of ubiquitous. So everybody thinks it's inert, you know, it's used in all the pills too, as an inert ingredient. But let me show you some data that might persuade you otherwise. So we were using this, we were asked to use it as a uh, negative control. So let's see. Uh, if you look at the graph here, just look at the, the longest bar. I can't use the pointer. So that's the silica at 100 micrograms per ml. Um, and you can see uh, how much uh, of a, a cell death it's caused. So this particular dehydrogenase comes out of the cell membrane when the cell membrane is leaky. And the cell membrane is leaky only when there's a lot of cell death. So, and if you see the simulant, it's in between. If you see the middle three lines and you see the TiO3, which is the uh, uh, negative control, you don't see much, right? Hold your thought on that. We then decided, we said, okay, we are seeing overall uh, cell death. 
um, in the medial range in the LDS or the stimulant, let's look at what happens to the DNA repair. So what is DNA repair? You're getting constantly bombarded by UV, some cosmic rays and everything else, right? Your DNA is getting damaged, but your cells adapt by using these families of DNA repair enzymes. What they do, especially this 8-oxo, let's just call it 8-oxo, this particular enzyme will remove all of the 8-oxo complex guanine, okay? So it will take off all the damaged stuff and just go through the undamaged stuff, just skip it. So it's just like sewing, right? You sew the holes and the machine, if the machine can just sort of go over the intact portions and just keep on sewing the uh, broken holes, then that, that's what the repair enzymes do. But then we wanted to see what happens. So if the DNA doesn't get repaired, then the nucleus is not intact anymore. There's a little tail, it looks like a comet tail, okay? This is what the cells look like. So you see the intact cell and you see the comet sort of come around. It's a very difficult assay to do. So we did about, we scored about 75 tails every time. And if you see with TiO2, uh, you see that the uh, tail is uh, a little bit longer, but it's not an intense tail. Whereas if you see it with the lunar simulant, it's a fat tail, but we saw a lot of DNA damage in there. But in the TiO2, we were not supposed to see DNA damage we saw DNA damage. So that's that's where, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about, more about, and this is a little bit more, I'm not, I'm not gonna focus too much on that. So uh, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, uh, uh, you've got to label the DNA and things like that. So we also looked at some human dermal fibroblasts to look at wound healing functions because we said, okay, if it's gonna cause inflammation, it's going to affect the immune system. So does it work with, uh, you know, does, will it spoil the wound healing function? So we looked at uh, the dermal fibroblasts. We also looked at, have you, has anybody here heard of apoptosis? Again, I'm sorry, I, I harp on Greek mythology. It's uh, derived from the Greek word thanatopsis, which means falling leaves. So in autumn, when the Greeks saw that the leaves were falling, they called it thanatopsis and then it became apoptosis. It's a very specific form of cell death. Like when a baby is born, the fingers are kind of webbed, right? So it's programmed cell death. So then the, the cells, how do you get a clean ba baby fingers? Initially, you see those downy thingy, the skin kind of comes off. So it's programmed cell death that then cleans it up. So, so that happens, right? So, so in cells that are damaged, the DNA is damaged, you're supposed to have programmed cell death come in and sort of take away the cells that aren't supposed to divide further. But in cancer, programmed cell death goes down, goes, I guess it sort of the program shuts down, the cell is not able to, it gets shut off in the cell and the cell proliferates in a mad fashion. So, uh, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest fashion kind of. So we measure a couple of enzymes called caspase three and seven to look at the uh, uh, activity. And you also, the way the cell re responds to the environment is through the cytoskeleton. It's a lot of protein fibers around and the cytoskeleton um, also changed with the uh, dust part. If you look at the apoptosis, you can see controls, right? Controls were fine, very little uh, apoptosis in general, okay? Um, and you can see silica, the apoptosis was up. So here there was inflammation going on and you can see, uh, and, and, and the three points are just 24, 48, and 72. And we have to confine ourselves to 72 our time points because the cell doubles. Only whatever you see within the cell's doubling time is actually relevant. And um, look at the stress fibers and the controls. Don't you see they're quite beautiful, right? If you uh, look at these, uh, these are uh, very high resolution uh, environmental microscope. They can also measure autofluorescence, which I'm gonna show you next. You can see the fibers on top there, really nice intact fibers. Look at the uh, lunar simulant. Can you, this is the grandma scarf here, the silk. Can you see the frame? Can you see more vacuole formation? Uh, in the 72 hours and the 144 hours, you see more, more, more and more vacuoles. So some of the cellular organelles are being destroyed. The stress fibers are being destroyed. So the cell is not able to respond to its environment. Okay. And again, wound healing, you can make the fibroblasts grow and you can make a little scratch in the middle and see how fast the cells grow. Usually a cell doubles between 48 and 72 hours. If you look with the lunar cement, and you can actually see some of the simulant in the... Uh, in the on top of the cells too. So it doesn't really dissolve, it just gets suspended. You can see that with the simulant, the bridge is not, in, look at the control at 72 hours. Can you see the, uh, can you, uh, if I may be so 
someone can let it be there. So see the cells, you see, they're covering the scratch, then they don't cover the scratch. There's a few cells here, there's a few cells here, they don't, they don't cover the scratch. So wound healing is definitely impaired. So we went and analyzed some of the genes that are involved here, and uh, we looked at, uh, uh, you know, uh, more than 40,000 genes belonging to 27 pathways. Um, and these are in arrays. You could, you could, uh, you could, uh, and we found that there were at least, uh, these were the, on the left, if you look, these are the list of genes that are there in the array. And on the right, if you see there, the number of genes that are actually altered uh, related to those particular pathways. And why are we looking at these pathways? Because those are essential to the function of the cell. And if you look at the p-values, they're pretty uh, high uh, confidence as well. I don't like to worship at the shrine of 0.05. I like to worship at the shrine of 0.001 if possible. Yeah, so, and this is the autofluorescence. And again, this shows you the control cells don't have too many. Uh, so this is all when the cell respires, it's using a lot of electron donors and acceptors like NAD, pH, et cetera. They autofluoresce, so you can measure that. So you can see this is quite an intact sort of a, uh, uh, array of uh, the organelles, etc. This is the nucleus, and if you come in here, you start to see these vacuoles form, right? So, and then you can see a lot of vacuole formation in 44 hours. And again, these are some of the conclusions that we've uh, reached. And uh, uh, Dr. Das, we should publish soon with some of the other stuff that. We, well, we had a small grant from the Royal Society, uh, and then he had come over to our lab for about three months and uh, he had done some work as well so some of the modeling side it would be easy to see what happens the low-hanging fruit as well um, so again um, cell adhesion pathways if you look at the pathways those were some of the most uh, effective pathways that we saw and cell adhesion is very important because the cells have to stay attached to your tissue you know in the, in the interstitial layers and um, that's when they signal the best so when cell adhesion gets affected then the cells don't signal as well. So that's a problem. And then the function becomes a big problem. And the extracellular matrix, and that's how they actually adapt to the environment. I'll show you a little bit of that later uh, this afternoon. And then just a little bit uh, about the lab. I'm a space life scientist. Um, I have flown, I have been the PI for about one, two, three, four, what, five space flight experiments, two on shuttle. Um, I started my career in this at the fag end of the shuttle era. Um, and then uh, was lucky enough to get uh, three space flight experiments, SpaceX three, six, and eight. Three, I was a PI, six and eight, I was co-PI with, uh, with another German PI from Magdeburg. Uh, we've done a couple of parabolic flights where we can test proof of concepts, which goes uh, forms about 32 parabolas. Uh, but there's a little bit of hypergravity in between because when, you know, when it goes up and then comes down is the free fall. Um, and also some high altitude flight experiments, all with immuno. I'm an immunologist by training, so did a lot of immunology experiments to look at T cell suppression. So again, immune suppression happens like it does on Earth in aging, um, up in microgravity. Um, and these are some of the collaborators: DLR is uh, the German Space Agency, ESA, STEC. Uh, Nanorax is another company that makes the space flight. So in order to fly cells up in space, we have to actually um, uh, you know, uh, fabricate the whole experiment. There's no convection. Uh, we have to design everything from the temperature, the incubator, everything. Um, so it, it's it's quite a task. Um, and then uh, work with some uh, natural supplements uh, with amino chemical company in Japan, um, as well as uh, there was some work with uh, um, Nestle as well, uh, and also some breast cancer work because I came out of. Uh, cancer biology and cancer immunology. So, um, and now we, I have one space flight pending with the University of Nancy. We're looking at what happens to antibody production in space flight and hoping that that will also give us some insights into, um, you know, disease resistance here on Earth. And of course, Aarhus, uh, Oslo, uh, Singapore, Porto Alegre, Lafra, of course, is one of them, and Lorraine, and a bunch of other schools in Firenze as well. And uh, there's more, but that's okay. Um, and again, th th this is the lab's expertise um, uh, with tissue engineering. So one of the apparatuses that we have uh, to mimic or to model space flight, and I'll show you that later this afternoon, uh, that did something different. We didn't expect it. It actually allowed cells to come together. 
um, has it put in the body to, for us to be able to make these little tissue-like assemblies. So now we have little organoids that then we can use as a uh, pharmaceutical test bed, or we can even put some stress and strain on it. We could do a bunch of different things with that. So uh, it, it sort of gave us another model to work with as quite similar to the human body without having to use animals and things like that. And again, like I said, in vitro, it takes out the neuroendocrine stress. Um, and then we do a lot of uh, space flight analogs. We now have acquired a machine where we can actually mimic partial gravity. Before we could only do um, model microgravity, but now we can also mimic one third and one sixth gravity. So we're quite excited um, about that. And again, uh, we have some nutritional immunomodulation work as well with some supplements to augment the immune system, because you know it's required to augment the immune system before it's good if you naturally do it, then, then you get attacked by, uh, by a disease uh, or a microbe or whatever. And again, we do some drug delivery, nanotechnology and uh, toxicology and mechanisms of action. Um, and I think, you know, after this, I'm thinking I should do more environmental uh, pollution related subjects because the techniques we have in the lab are very, very uh, versatile. They could be adapted to do different things. Uh, and, and that's, you know, uh, because after uh, when I had COVID in November, that's when we struggled to breathe a little bit. That's when the, one of the first times, even after the flu, you see you have coughing and bronchitis and everything. You don't feel that. When COVID happened, it, it's, a, it's a different beast altogether. It's, it's, it's like sucks the breath out of you. I really sort of came to terms with that definition of that phrase. It does. It's like you feel like you're walking that life death type thing. And um, it goes away, thank God it must be it. But I'm just saying, I mean, it's something that I wouldn't wish on anybody. And it's uh, it's just, it's it was catch 22, I can tell. And these are just some pictures of uh, things that have gone on in the lab. That was a SpaceX 3 experiment, you can see. And, um, and we were right. I was, if you look at the middle picture, I was getting ready to put it in the hardware. And this, this is us assembling all the hardware right here to put it uh, in our experimental box. And they suddenly said, drop everything. The flight has been scrubbed, which means we couldn't fly. So then we had to go back and start all over again. And in the middle of one of the flights, there was a pro there was an alligator outside our uh, uh, lab. And we couldn't go out till very late at night because you know they had to come in and uh, sort of put the alligators have a cozy sleep for a little while and party talking. So, uh, and, and Disney, you know, and, and, and Disney's come up a lot in Florida these days. So Disney actually experiments with these alligators to make sure Kennedy Space Flight Center is on a little nature reserve. Um, and so they, they want to make sure that the propellants and other things are not affecting the wildlife there. So they test these guys immunologically, periodically, and there's a big syringe on that alligator. Um, and so they did all of that. So after three or four scrubs, we finally flew. Um, and it was such an experience. And, uh, look, <laughs> I have it right there. But that's an alligator. They were trying to catch it so that they could sample the blood. So we, we left everything, we went there. And it, was, it, it, it was just a different experience altogether. And I've had multiple experiences of those, um, but it's nerve wracking, it's very stressful. So, you know, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, it's something that's very motivating. And, and I, I'll talk a little bit more in the afternoon about how uh, it actually reflects to life back on Earth a little bit um, and, and how wise would it be useful to uh, study. So if that was too technical, I apologize. And uh, no, it's very interesting. So yeah, I conclude, thank you. <laughs>
I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and comments. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Later on. yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much again. Yes. So uh, I would welcome, I would invite uh, Dr. Uh, Nebika Deka from the Montreal University. Uh, he is going to talk about uh, remote sensing, artificial intelligence, and how they Thank can you. be utilized for air quality activity monitoring uh, for you. Thank you, Riganta, and thank you for uh, inviting me here for this talk. I am just uh, sort of aware that uh, after two brilliant speakers, what else could I add uh, to this to this very important topic? I'll try, uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, when Professor Gupta uh, was looking at the um, uh, measurements of the air quality uh, with the in-situ measurements and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lalita going a little bit more into the uh, cellular level. I think I'll sort of zoom out a little bit and uh, go into um, a data collection from space and how uh, that can then help in uh, air quality measurements. So yes, I'm Lipika, um, uh, trying to keep up with my other speakers. <laughs> is, is this the... The speed. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I think I'll. So, just a little bit about myself because this is not my primary area of work. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a computer engineer by education and an associate professor in computer science. Uh, one of my major activities these days is as the faculty head of research students, where I look after the uh, sort of the life cycle management of uh, PhD and uh, masters by research students uh, strategically. And in uh, research interest, it's basically in uh, two main streams. Uh, one is machine learning, development of techniques and applying them. And that is where I started at Loughborough University a couple of years ago as a postdoc in intelligent transport systems. And uh, also this uh, intelligent transport system has been my route towards air quality because uh, transport being one of the major causes of uh, air quality uh, degradation. Uh, I work quite a bit on agriculture, again, remote sensing. That was perhaps my way into remote sensing uh, was agriculture, uh, water as well as cybersecurity, and that's on the application of machine learning tools. Uh, one of my major uh, interests, uh, it's, it's very much core computer science, uh, and uh, this is something that I'm, uh, I'm very keen in pursuing in uh, at the moment is uh, we have a lot of uh, Internet of Things devices and it's um, it's sort of penetrating every you know uh, every part. Uh, we have got our microphone and our camera in front of us. That itself is a uh, Internet of uh, Things device. Now, uh, how how do we update these devices so that we can prolong their life and we reduce digital waste? And how do we then, so to prolong the life, how do we update it? And while updating it, how do we uh, sort of, you know, keep intact the uh, architecture of these systems? So that is an area that I'm working on. If you want to look a little bit more, uh, of course, uh, Google Scholar is the place. A little bit more uh, on um, uh, the Institute uh, where, uh, you know, I'm hosted. Our, our home is the Institute of Artificial Intelligence. We work a lot on uh, models. Uh, so... Uh, these are some of the core uh, development areas that we are looking at, and we have got a very respectable ranking in the Shanghai uh, ranking for computer science. It's a ranking that ranks only on the research aspects of the institute. And uh, within and outside the university, we collaborate a lot. Uh, so uh, we have got four faculties. So the Institute with the Faculty of Computing Engineering and Media, these are some of the areas that we collaborate in where we apply our techniques that we develop. Uh, then with Faculty of Art and Design, I am myself involved with the Museum Studies group there. Uh, the Faculty of Business and Law uh, with COVID supply chain management and of course air pollution caused by the uh, entire supply chain management. There is quite a bit of work that we are, going, we are doing there. And with the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences, with things that uh, Lalita spoke about a little bit, we do a little bit on the cellular, uh, cellular parts, uh, you know, at that fine granularity level. Uh, medical imaging pharmaceuticals. Now, swiftly moving on to the topic of uh, this, uh, this seminar is uh, air quality, of course, and uh, going back to the sources, uh, it is both, you know, uh, the air quality degradation is as a result of human activities, and uh, of course, a little bit on natural activities as well, like volcanoes and uh, wildfires. Uh, and no doubt some of these are also caused uh, because of human activities. 
the statistics are staggering. It's there uh, for you down to 7 million there. The death prematurely is both from indoor and outdoor pollution. Uh, and today we are looking at more on the outdoor, uh, uh, outdoor sort of air quality a little bit more. Uh, I'll not go into this because I think Professor Gupta has uh, covered this quite a bit. Now, what is air quality? And it's basically uh, the presence above limit of certain particles there. And, uh, and again, uh, why do we need to monitor air quality? And it's because of the effect that this has, not only on the health, it also has a lot of effect on the climate. Uh, it has, this again brings back to where uh, I have come to this from food security. It affects a lot on the food production. Uh, so these are just some of it. So what do we do? Uh, we could either mitigate or adapt. Now we all know we cannot really adapt to the, you know, the changing air quality. We have to look at mitigation. And to be able to look at mitigation, we now need to know that what are the sources. So that's a precursor. Find out the sources of, uh, uh, of from where these, uh, you know, uh, the various uh, elements, uh, you know, carbon, uh, nitrogen dioxide, uh, uh, ozone uh, layer depletion, and things like that are coming from and that brings us to our thing is that we need data uh, and there are different ways of getting the data as to identify the source of the air pollution and it could be in situ measurements which professor gupta has uh, covered uh, quite a bit of it it could come from computer modeling again with computer modeling there's a lot of data that you would need uh, to model uh, from in situ or thing and what i'm going to cover here is through remote sensing the word remote sensing data, it uh, tells you from the word remote, you monitor it remotely, something that you don't touch. The last two pictures there, uh, of course, the first one is of London. We have got the in-situ measurement there uh, on the roadside. The second is, of course, the uh, computer modeling. And the last two is our uh, remote sensing. So either from satellites or even from instruments on drones. Uh, now, we have got measurements at different granularity. And of course, there will be issues with uh, the data. And if you look at this graph here, on the x-axis, you have the special uh, scale. So how much does each of the measurements cover in the special range? And on the x-axis, uh, sorry, y-axis, you have got the temporal scale. So uh, what is the time scale? So if you look at the blue, uh, blue uh, thing here, it is the uh, portable low-cost uh, uh, in-situ measurements, streetwise especially. And even time, it'll give you very accurate data, real time and daily data. Now, as we move further along the x-axis, we will see that as we, and there are other, uh, you know, um, in situ or a, a little bit remote, uh, like the one that we have on the street side, which will give you at the city level. So from street, we're getting to the city level. And also in the temporal, we get daily and seasonal. Then if you go further along the uh, x-axis, we see there that the global modeling or the computer modeling will provide us a little bit more globally and also on you know, daily and seasonally. And of, again, with satellite monitoring, we get a little bit more wider. And that is one of the reasons why you know, we are coming out and zooming out and looking at uh, more you know, wider, uh, wider, uh, wider data there. Uh, and, uh, but again, uh, as you go along the excesses, the accuracy of the data decreases. And there is when there is a need to now merge the data, the data that you get in the street and real time to that you get globally. Uh, again, different sensors do that, electrochemical. So there are, uh, whether it's an in-situ measurement or in, uh, you know, in a space or drones, you have got instruments there, sensors there that is able to uh, uh, measure these various uh, elements. So if from space where I'm doing the re remote sensing, there are two ways, passive sensing. So you basically uh, measure what is reflected back uh, and what is reflected from like, you know, the sun rays. So it's from a different source, you give the energy and what's reflected back is what is emitted by its own. And there is of course the active sensing where the instrument itself sends, uh, you know, energy to the earth and then what is reflected back, it's then, um, it's then measured. Uh, along the entire electromagnetic spectrum. 
Uh, now we know that there is data. Uh, we know there is data at a wider level from uh, satellites, but there are limitations. And to be able to infer or get anything useful, uh, we do need to understand the limitations and then where the uh, models work. One of us, of course, is spectral resolution. Like I said, it's along the electromagnetic spectrum. So you may be able to do a band of uh, frequency at any granularity, very fine or more. If you do it at a fine granularity, you will get more uh, information, but that may not be possible by all the satellites. Uh, of course, now more and more satellites are giving you, or the instruments on the satellites are giving you um, data at a very, very fine granularity, uh, granularity on the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Of course, with the radiometric resolution, if you're taking photos, you'll understand that you know the sharpness a more sharp, less uh, less sharp. That's also uh, you know depending upon the expense and things like that. That's also a limitation or an opportunity if you can afford it. The spatial resolution, where one pixel in an image from a satellite might cover about fifty kilometers square, or it could cover a hundred kilometers square. So, or even more or lesser one kilometer square. So, if you if one pixel covers lesser, that's a much more finer resolution, and you get much much more information from it. And then, of course, the temporal resolution. Most of our satellites, what it do, it, it doesn't really start, you know sit up on top of us. It's moving. So we do not get, uh, you know, the hourly or the sometimes not even daily from some uh, some of the instruments on the satellite. You get it at once in a day or twice in a day. So it depends. So the temporary resolution is also one of the limitations. Then again, from uh, some of the instruments in on the satellite, you cannot measure uh, the surface. Like for example, uh, what uh, Professor Gupta touched on is the PM or the particle uh, matter. You cannot measure it directly from satellites, and you need to measure it indirectly by aerosol optical depth. And then again, aerosol optical depth, the measurement, which is uh, which doesn't have a metric, it depends upon the size of the particles. It depends upon the chemical composition of the particles. So there is no direct relationship between the uh, PM and the AOD. And that again, uh, you know, is an issue. Now we have spoken about all these limitations, the relationship among variables and the resolutions. Now there we come into our, um, uh, machine learning approaches that, you know, we can use it. Again, you know, we hold our thoughts there because machine learning uh, approaches itself has got, uh, you know, many limitations and we have to work and we're developing uh, those to work on it. So uh, again, uh, one of the ways is to, you know, we have got a very fine granularity from the in-situ measurement and we have got the spatial, that is the thing. So we need to fuse it. And that is where also we are coming with, uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, machine learning tools to be able to fuse, you know, data from different sources to get more accurate data. Uh, you know, accuracy comes from the in-situ and the, you know, spatial comes from the more uh, uh, satellite or the remote sensing data. Now, uh, I'm just, I'll not go through any of these. These are most of the statistical, uh, you know, approaches uh, that has been used. And we have seen uh, today in our previous talk that have been used. And then of course we have got the machine learning approaches uh, that have come in. And some of the machine learning approaches that we use are uh, decision, decision trees, the gradient boosting uh, nuclear net, uh, neural networks, deep learning, and some of a uh, combination of these tools again. Uh, Again, like I said, machine learning tools has got its advantages. Um, so it's less sensitive about the collinearity among predictive variables. But one of the major things about uh, machine learning or AI tools like the neural networks and the deep learning is the fact that it can handle large, large, very large data sets, which is not being possible by the uh, linear regression. And also uh, with a linear regression and other regression uh, algorithms, you need to have a linear uh, relationship between the uh, variables, which is not required in the uh, um, ML models. We have got uh, limitations, uh, of course, uh, and uh, this, and in, in, in this case, in the air quality, the number of predictors are really small, and many of the machine learning tools are not, uh, are not designed to do, uh, you know, predict uh, for small number of predictors. Uh, again, uh, you know, in, in the air quality, for example, the air quality in this, uh, in this space is affected by the air quality, say in Leicester, because the wind is blowing. So you have got a special dependence uh, on, uh, of air quality together with temporal dependence. So the air quality today depends upon tomorrow, yesterday and 
so on. Now, temporal, we can capture, but spatial dependence, it's a little bit difficult to explicitly uh, uh, cover or uh, uh, by the machine learning tool. So these are some of the things that we need to consider while we uh, develop these things. Um, I know that the time is thing. Can I take a couple of more minutes? Yeah, about nine minutes. All right, okay, I was going by that. Thank you. Uh, so I should be able to finish. Uh, so again, uh, and some of it, which about the temporal resolution. So we now have got, uh, because I was saying that the satellite moves and we get uh, very infrequent data, uh, but now there are some geostationary data that are up on space. Uh, and it's a constellation of about three different satellites from the Korean side, from of course NASA, and we also have over uh, from the um, European side as well. So we have got our Northern Hemisphere covered. This is one of the payloads on the, uh, on the uh, NASA one that went up in 2022, I think, which, is, uh, which has got many of these instruments and sensors. And it's, it's very exciting time for many of us because we will get data that we were not able to get before and perhaps a little bit lesser to the surface because we were more mostly concentrating with the air column above and depending upon the in-situ measurements for uh, you know, surface, uh, surface uh, air quality. Uh, I will now just, uh, so that was the background. I'll just cover two projects that I have been work, I have worked on uh, and uh, on the air quality side of things. And there are a few more that I'll be giving uh, references to. Now, on this project, which I worked with University of Malaga in Spain, uh, why Spain? I'll come to that in a little bit. Uh, and here we did uh, an uh, NO2 uh, forecasting, and we used about a couple of models to be able to do that. Uh, we have seen this, and I'll not go into this. NO2 is uh, highly an irritant and a reactive uh, substance, and it, uh, uh, you know, it causes a, a lot of... Uh, um, respiratory diseases. And uh, we call, that was our study area in Spain. It's in the south of Spain. And uh, in, in uh, uh, I excuse my pronunciation, in the Bay of Algecairas. Alge so the, it's, it's an area we where you have a lot of petrochemical um, industries. It has got one of the uh, European largest steel industry, actually, um, stainless steel. Around uh, around there and many other and also it's a it's a port so you know trading port a lot of ships come in so you can imagine the amount of you know the pollution that's there and so that's the city of Al uh, Algecairas uh, where we have got one of our stations uh, and because of this you know the uh, environmental conditions there this was one of our study areas so uh, and all those uh, uh, the points there it's uh, the measuring stations where uh, both uh, pollutants as well as meteorological data has been collected so our main aim was to it, it came from the government there and our main aim was to look at the uh, look at the air quality in the in the highly populated uh, city there and that is where we concentrated in that is that number one on that uh, picture there uh, so that's a thing, and uh, we needed to forecast, and why we needed to forecast was that the uh, the government wanted to understand if there was, sometimes you needed to, you know, uh, give some uh, uh, instructions to the uh, citizens there, you know, based on the air quality, and that is where we looked at uh, how far we could, uh, we could forecast. So we had a baseline model that looked at only the uh, data from one. And then we also looked at the data from all the other stations. So we had got we had two different models based on the data. We looked at all the uh, exogenous uh, data that came from all the other stations, together with the uh, uh, together with the meteorological var uh, variables. For example, the wind direction, like I just said, like something that's happening in, say, for example, you know, Leicester, the wind blows it over. So we needed to look at the wind speed, direction, humidity. Uh, solar radiation as well. I will not know much about how solar radiation affects, but it does. Atmospheric pressure, temperature, etc. So these were some of the data that we looked at. We uh, and the two models that we use were as artificial neural networks. Uh, many of you have used it in different ways. Uh, we have got uh, you know the input layer. It's not just one hidden layer. You can have more than more than one hidden layer inside, and of course you have got the output layer 
in the input layer, you then feed in uh, feed in uh, you know variable uh, values, which is then feed it forward, and we use that back propagation, and then we basically feed back the error so that the model is developed and the error is uh, decreased. So at the end, we are expecting the error of the model will be uh, lesser and lesser. And once we train the model, we then can uh, you know use it to uh, to forecast uh, air quality or NO2 in our case. Now, this is one of our basic models, but then uh, we uh, went on because we were not able to get very good results and you cannot uh, uh, with, with a basic uh, artificial neural network. We looked at recurrent neural networks, but with recurrent neural networks, the problem was that it was not able to uh, find or capture the dependence on the temporal level. So it was not able to capture uh, the dependence of today's uh, data with 10 days ago or you know some of that and hence we needed to look at long short-term memory uh, networks. I'll just explain a little bit about what is the difference between this basic model and that. If you look at the middle layer there, there is a memory block and this memory block will have cells such as this one or more such cells and uh, this is able to, these memory blocks are able to decide that this particular variable is important to me, I need to store it for a future use. So that is the way how that temporal dependence is taken care of. And, uh, and with this, uh, with this uh, model there, uh, we were able to get quite, uh, quite, good, um, uh, quite good results. And there were other things, I'll just come to the results in a bit. The other thing that we needed to look at is because it is uh, you know, a time series data. So uh, cross-validation is a very uh, common, uh, common way of validating uh, artificial neural networks or any machine learning um, uh, models for that uh, matter. But cross-validation usually does, uh, you know, uh, it takes a test set randomly. But we, we cannot take it randomly in this case because there was a temporal dependence. And hence, we had to look at a block cross-validation. So this is what we did, is that the blue part there was used for uh, training the data. And that yellow part or the orange part at the end uh, was used for testing. And by doing this block thing, we were able to preserve or keep the dependence of the uh, uh, of the data, so the temporal dependence, and the middle bit there that ties the blue and the uh, yellow bit there is the data that we had to remove because, uh, as you know, that there is temporal dependence, but uh, we needed to check that this dependence did not affect the testing, and hence we uh, we removed part of it that uh, could affect the results. And this is some of the uh, results that we get. The first one got, uh, the first one is of course, when we predicted, uh, you know, one, one unit of time ahead and then four and then uh, eight. And uh, it's needless to say, the one that was the short term was the most, uh, most um, you know, sort of accurate. Uh, but uh, again, we are working on this to be able to get uh, more accurate results for a long-term um, uh, long prediction. I'll quickly get to the last two slides. And this is something that we did with India with the uh, BITS, uh, Bits um, Hyderabad uh, uh, student there, where we looked at the remote sensing data for air pollution signature in India to be able to map that. And we use clustering algorithms there. Uh, being conscious of the time, I'm not going to the details and uh, uh, quite a few of it and the sources have been covered by Professor Gupta. We looked, uh, we took the Sentinel-5 uh, sat, uh, satellite um, uh, data there and uh, these were some of the uh, some of the um, elements or the variables that we looked at. And signature is, of course, you know, you could consider like it a vector with uh, you know values for each of these different uh, different elements. There, we looked at January to uh, December 2018, and then we clustered. Uh, uh, these were some of the uh, clustering algorithms there. And uh, just, just while we are the clustering algorithms, I'm not going to the detail. I'm happy to discuss each of these algorithms separately. Uh, ju just while we are here, the first two gave very, very similar results. The last one uh, gave a little bit uh, you know, different result, but then it also shows that you can use different types of algorithms if your objective is different. So you could use k-means uh, clustering if your objective is different, and you could use db-scan if your objective is slightly different. 
Uh, this is what uh, we, uh, we uh, was the result. If you do state wide cluster, the part that is red is the most polluted uh, part. And then it's, it's the, you know, NCR around Delhi came out uh, red. And that's because of all the, uh, the population, the transport, the bricklins, and many other things uh, that goes on. With the district level, of course, with the uh, state level, because it's at a bigger granularity, uh, you, um, uh, you're averaging it out. So what you see red at the district level, you do not see red at the uh, state level. So again, at the, uh, at the district level, that was uh, sort of our uh, result there. And you could see there were clusters, like you can see somewhere here. These are, that's how you got there. So this is Chennai, and you can see these clusters of very, uh, very um, highly polluted areas, which is the uh, highly populated uh, cities of uh, India. So that sort of brings to a conclusion. These are some of the work that I did on the on the area of air quality, and uh, the last one is, of course, not my uh, my uh, publication. It's uh, where I looked at some of the data from. Just to conclude, um, again, that picture is from Bale, uh, Bale Woods here. Uh, air quality is important. Uh, monitoring and preserving air quality has become one of the most essential things, and we all know why. Uh, and it's affecting, and it's, it could be you know, man-made or natural. And uh, again, uh, we, are, we should be able to monitor and mitigate. Uh, we require data. And uh, I explain a little bit on the data. And this data has got its own uh, challenges. And to overcome these challenges, uh, uh, we have got the machine learning techniques. And that is also some of it that I have gone through it. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we have got a very, very interdisciplinary team here from humanities, from social sciences, from biology, from chemical engineering. And that's the need for that interdisciplinarity where I come from the method side and perhaps as an application. And uh, uh, to be able to look at this, you know, collectively and cohesively, we need that interdisciplinary approach. Uh, there is this little video that, uh, um, you know, I could leave you with. Uh, I don't know if I can play that from here or if you just uh, click on it, perhaps. Uh, uh, it, it, it's just something as a touching moment. It's, uh, you know, if you don't have our air quality uh, cleaner, this is not something, if you look at the chimp there, it was in, uh, 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 it was in captivity for almost 28 years. And it was just released into the wild, into the natural. And can you see how it looks? And then that hug that it gives. Now it's only possible because the air is still, you know, acceptable limits. And uh, we may not see this if we don't take care of it now. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Very interesting.